Hey, Deserve listeners, a lot of you have been asking me to react to this week's Last Week Tonight episode with John Oliver, which is about mental health. Let's watch. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Let's see what they say. Because there should not be a stigma around seeking help for mental health issues, and especially now, given that over the last two years, we've seen a spike in them. During the pandemic, about four in ten adults in the US have reported symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder. That's up from one in ten who'd reported them a year before. Yeah, anecdotally, I would agree with that, absolutely, that there has been a recent sharp spike in the last two years during the pandemic of anxiety, depression. I would also add relationship distress, substance use issues. Yeah, there's a huge demand for therapy and not enough therapists and not enough funding. But as people increasingly do seek help, they're discovering a system that is just not set up to provide it. There have long been wait lists to see a therapist, but it has gotten significantly worse since the pandemic, with 65% of psychologists reporting they had no capacity for new patients. In I'm actually surprised it's that low. Anecdotally, I would say 90 plus percent of the therapists that I know are at capacity or very close to it. It's really a big problem. Now, you would say, well, we just need more clinicians, and we do. And if you're thinking about becoming a clinician, all you got to do is look at this and say, wow, I mean, there's work for you. But the other thing I would say is that funding is a problem because for insurance companies and also for individuals who have kind of limited insurance in the United States, they can't afford it or they can afford very little or their insurance only has behavioral management systems like HMOs, Kaiser Permanente, these kinds of places. They will try to route you to therapists that are working in-house for the HMO who are trained and told to limit the amount of sessions. And that involves kind of almost like a gaslighting process that the therapist in the system will victimize the clients. You know, clients will say, I'm suffering, and they don't know what's wrong with them. They're just like, I'm suffering. I don't know what's wrong. I've, it's been years. They go to a therapist, and the therapist runs them through like three sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy and says, okay, you're done, and says, no, no, you don't need any more therapy. Meanwhile, the person is like, I don't feel that much better, though. Then they're back into the world, and they're like, well, I guess I'm done with therapy because that person said I was done, and all the while they have not been treated at all, or at least sufficiently. In fact, more than half the people who need mental health care do not receive it. And this is in the United States, of course. Around the world, not in every country, but in many countries, it's abysmal. For many people will email in to me and they'll say, there's no clinician within 100 miles of my home. With that rate being even higher for minority populations. Just take this couple whose 14-year-old was in crisis and who followed their pediatrician's advice to go straight to the ER with him. I remember we got out of the car and we hugged him and we said, we're going to do whatever it takes to help you. So to put this in context, as it might not be understood by everyone that in all likelihood, the child or teen was suicidal, imminently suicidal, and was in desperate need of help. That's usually the case. Whatever it takes. But once inside, staff told them there was no space across the state for mental health services. So they were admitted to the ED where- Just imagine that. No open beds in the entire state. Oh, just imagine that. Just imagine that. You have an abscess in your tooth, you're building pain throughout the day, and you say, okay, I've got to get help for this tooth, and there's nowhere for you to go. We live in the richest society that's ever existed on this planet, and nope. Not that there aren't people who could help you, but there's no one available. Now, who do we blame? We blame the government for either not regulating the insurance companies or not allocating tax money to pay for these services. That's the problem. If you want someone to blame, it's the government. If you want someone to blame further, it's the elected officials. And you want to blame someone even further, it's the voters for voting in elected officials or not pressuring them to allocate funds. We could easily do it. Tomorrow, the Congress could pass a bill allocating funds to spend billions of dollars that we have available to us. Our economy is in the trillions or something. Every American could have a clinician. So it's us. We are the problem. The reason why this child could not be seen is because of us. We thought tonight it'd be worth taking a look at our mental health care system, where the cracks are, some of the inadequate ways that we've tried to fill them, and why we are in this mess in the first place. And let's start with the fact that for many years, we kept people with mental illness in institutions, which were abhorrent. We eventually began shutting them down. 
mental health institutions in the past definitely had problems, but the stories sometimes become one dimensional and almost mythical, like a horror movie sort of situation. And certainly in all likelihood, those things happened, but there was a lot of help going on in those institutions as well. There were a lot of caring individuals, professionals that were working with the patients and many patients benefited from the treatment model. So I blame like movies like Batman and Arkham Horror, the video game <laughs> and other kinds of popular media. Now, certainly there were atrocities, absolute atrocities, people being given lobotomies, meaning essentially brain damage, because that's what a lot of clinicians were doing at the time to people with certain disorders. Sometimes lobotomies were given to people just because they were defiant to a parent that was strict. Horrible things were happening, but I want to point out that some good things are happening too. <laughs> The care would then take place mostly in outpatient community mental health centers, which was a good idea had we funded them properly. Yes, exactly. So I've watched John Oliver maybe every episode that he's ever made ever since he came out. There's sometimes when he dips into topics that I know about and half of it, I'm like, uh, I don't know. So I'm a little bit worried about that here. Uh, there's nothing thus far that is worrisome. But anyway, I really love this. So yeah, the asylum model was present for a number of years. And then we switched to a community mental health model, which was funded by Medicaid, Medicare, insurance, charities, this kind of thing. So when I first became a therapist in the mid nineties, that's where I worked. And the problem is, is that they're not funded enough, meaning that clinicians that work there are usually just starting out in their careers and they can't get another job anywhere else, or they're not established to have a private practice. And so for many clinicians, it's a stepping stone or it's like their first job. And then when they actually want to pay off their student loans, they quit the community mental health agency and they go into private practice. And in private practice, you can charge more. You're not charging necessarily a lot of money, but you're able to make enough money to pay your bills and raise kids and pay off your student loans and invest in your future and that kind of thing. Not a lot, but you know, at least some. The problem is, again, I just want to stress, it's us because we vote people into office and or we don't pressure them to allocate funds or increase taxes to pay for these facilities, to pay for the people in these facilities, not only to pay them more because they deserve more so they can actually pay off their student loans. I mean, just to give you an idea, just using myself as an example, when I graduated from graduate school 25 years ago in the mid 90s, I was being paid $13 an hour. I was in debt from school, which usually people go into debt when they're trying to get their graduate degree. And also I was living like a college student. I was eating extremely cheap food, top ramen, that kind of thing. I had very cheap rent. So I had my fixed amount of expenditures on rent and stuff. And then I had my student loan payment, which included interest, by the way. My $13 an hour didn't pay to cover that. So I was actually going more into debt as a therapist because the salary at a community mental health agency did not cover my extremely low expense situation and didn't cover the interest on my student loan, let alone the principal of the student loan. So I remember the time absolutely freaking out because I'm like every month and I kept track of it, I was going more and more into debt. And I thought, there's no way out. How do I get out of this? What am I supposed to do? And so that's when I started working 70 hours a week. I started teaching as a professor, which also pays very little. But then I also went into private practice. I was seeing clients at 11 p.m. at night because I would work my 40 hour a week job at the Community Mental Health Agency. I would teach on Fridays and I, I did four tens. I'd teach on Fridays. And then in the evenings on the weekends is when I saw all my private practice clients. And that's when I actually started to get ahead and pay off my bills. If the government and the politicians were to allocate funds so that I could have been paid one more dollar an hour, two more dollars an hour, I could have made $15 an hour, then I wouldn't have had to have worked 70 hours a week in order to maintain my life. There are over 6,000 mental health professional shortage areas in the US, and nearly 60% of those are in rural areas. And for those who live there and are struggling, things can get pretty grim. Yeah, as evidenced by the fact that the suicide rate is higher in rural areas, people often don't think of it that way. They think of, oh, where that, you know, the big city is where all that stress is and where everyone is doing those kinds of things. And per capita, rural areas are more vulnerable to this. 
partially because of lack of access to mental health care. The problem was is that, you know, it was, uh, yeah, you know, suck it up, it'll be better tomorrow. Everything will be fine tomorrow. I'll suck it up, buttercup. I hear that phrase a lot around here, suck it up, buttercup. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. What does that mean exactly? <laughs> For me, it eventually meant a couple of shots of Jack in my coffee in the morning when I went to work, a um, couple of beers that... Yeah, around the world, this is the case where people, regardless of where they live, what culture they live in, because, you know, even in the most progressive cities like Seattle, you will still have this kind of attitude. We are far from realizing the needs of humans in this way. And you will hear people internally or externally get this message of just like, well, you know, just suck it up, buttercup, and just shake it off, you know, stop ruminating. You just got to look on the bright side. And especially for men, because men are socialized to not ask for help in general, ever. And so, but really everyone is shamed that way. And you start looking for some kind of answer and you find off, you know, what a lot of people will find, particularly men, but really a lot of people that when they drink alcohol, at least for a time, they don't feel as bad. They might be numb because of the substance or might even just give them some kind of a little bit of euphoria, whatever. And they're like, well, it's not good that I'm drunk all day long and that my breath smells and that I have hangovers and that my health is going down the tubes, but at least I feel slightly better overall. But now you have an addiction that is now starting to take its toll and you start to go into denial and you have rages because you drink too much sometimes and your life really spins out of control, all because we have a culture that shames people for asking for help and we don't have the help available when they do ask for help. If you're looking for a provider of color, you may have real trouble as white people make up 84% of US psychologists, meaning that some patients may have a much harder time finding someone that they can relate to. Like this woman in Philadelphia who began seeing a white therapist but felt that they weren't connecting. It felt like she just wasn't getting it. And I yeah, this is another huge problem. And it, things are getting better. That statistic is actually better than it was before. It's still terrible, but it's better than it was before. Now, does that mean that if you're a black person and you can't find a black therapist, you're doomed? No, you can find white therapists or other kinds of Asian therapists that might be able to at least somewhat understand or understand from a different way. An important aspect of outcomes in therapy is when the therapist and the client are a good fit for each other, meaning that they just, I don't know, I could go into the research on it and all of our clinical language, but just think of it like you vibe well with someone. You're compatible as a therapist and as a client. If you are a person of color and you are thinking about becoming a therapist, one, there's a shortage, so there's a lot of clients available. Even in private practice, I'll tell you, you know, I've shepherded a lot of people, hundreds of people into the field, and the vast majority have full practices within a couple of years, maybe three years, and are earning 200000 a year, $150,000 a year before taxes, that kind of thing. Not only will you be able to do that good work, but you would also be able to serve people that are looking just for you and can't find you. I could tell it was from you know the cultural differences um but i felt like i couldn't be myself in the session i could imagine particularly white people mm -hmm. hearing that story and thinking well but it doesn't matter what color your skin is <laughs> yes uh yeah, that's a problem for sure. I would say that it's becoming less and less of a problem. Like in Seattle, for example, and at my university at Antioch, Seattle, we have been for a number of years, maybe 20 years, really thoroughly talking about this topic of culture, ethnicity, LGBTQ+, ageism, ableism, all the isms are talked about a lot. In fact, in a lot of programs, a lot of contemporary programs like mine, pretty much every class, there's a thorough discussion of those factors. Whereas 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and in some pockets around the United States, they're still kind of catching up to those ideas. If you have a clinician that doesn't come from a program that really talked about that enough, or a region of the country where that wasn't a focus, then yeah, you're gonna have a white therapist that will be like, well, what's the big deal? You're black, I'm white, you know, mental health is colorblind, that kind of thought. You're just like, ugh. All right, well, that does it for that episode. I'll, I'll pick this up later because I'm yammering all the time. So uh, I'll do part two later. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. You really, really do.